Chapter 28 There was a low mutter of interest from the assembled crowd as the five companions followed Hodak into the main hall. At the head of the room, Ragnak sat on his massive, carved chair. Beside, and slightly behind him, Will recognised the slightly stooped form of Slagor, as the treacherous Jarl leant down to whisper something to Ragnak. The Obial angrily waved him away, then gestured towards Evanlin, who was trying to make herself as inconspicuous as possible behind Irak. Bring her forward! Ragnak's massive voice, used to dominating the howling gales of the Stormwhite, boomed painfully in the low-ceilinged hall. Evanlin shrank back, instinctively, then recovered as Holt touched her arm and met her eyes with a reassuring smile. She straightened her shoulders and drew herself up to full height. Will watched in admiration as she walked down the cleared space in the centre of the hall. Holt, Irak, and the two apprentices followed close behind her. Horace, Will noted, was continually easing his sword in its scabbard, lifting it to free the blade, then allowing it to drop back again. As he noticed, Will's own hand strayed to the hilt of his throwing knife. If things went as badly as they all feared, he decided that knife was for Slagor. Once before on Skorgal, Will had demonstrated his skill with the knife to Irax and Slagor's crews, throwing across the room and skewering a small wooden keg next to Slagor's hand. This time, there would be no keg. The room watched in utter silence as Evelyn stopped before Ragnak's raised dais. She met the Obial's glower with a calm, composed expression on her face. Again, Will found himself almost overwhelmed by her courage and her composure. Slagor signed to a pair of attendants by a side door. Bring in the slave, he called. His voice was soft and silky, totally unlike Ragnak's forced bellow. He sounded very pleased with the current turn of events, Will thought. The two men, rowers from Slagor's crew, opened the door and dragged in a protesting, weeping figure. She was a middle-aged woman, her hair greying and her face lined before its time with the strain of unending labour, poor food and the threat of constant punishment that was the lot of a slave in Hallisholm. The sailors dragged her forward and cast her down on the floor in front of Evelyn. She crouched there miserably, her eyes down. Look up, slave, Slagor told her in that same quiet voice. Her sobbing continued and she shook her head, her eyes still cast down at the floor. Slagor moved quickly, stepping down from the platform and drawing his sax knife in one smooth movement. He held the razor-sharp knife below the woman's chin, pressing into the flesh of her neck with not quite sufficient force to break the skin. I said look up, he repeated, and applied pressure to the knife to raise her eyes until she was gazing at Evelyn. As she saw the girl, the woman began sobbing even louder. Shut up, Slagor told her. Shut up that noise and tell the Obayal what you told me. There were angry wheels across the woman's face. Obviously, she had been beaten recently. Her ragged shift was torn in several spots as well, and more red marks were visible on her body through the gaps. In some places, blood had soaked through the thin material. Her tear-filled eyes pleaded with Evelyn. I'm sorry, my lady, she said, her voice breaking. They beat me until I told. Evelyn took an involuntary step towards her, but Slagor's knife swung up and around to confront her and stop her coming closer. Beside him, Will heard Horace's quick intake of breath and saw his hand fall to the sword hilt once more. He placed his own hand over Horace's, 
stopping him from drawing the sword. The heavily built apprentice looked around at him, surprised. Will shook his head slightly. He realised that Horace's movement had been a reflex reaction, and he knew that in this tinderbox atmosphere, if his friend ever drew that sword, it could mean the end of all of them. Not yet, he mouthed the words. If the time came, he was willing to join Horace in an attack on Slagor and Ragnath. But first, he thought, they should see if Holt couldn't talk their way out of this situation. Leave the talking to me, the ranger had told them before they left his apartment, and don't do anything until I tell you. Clear? The two boys had nodded. Then Holt had added, This puts an altogether different slant on our accusing Slagor, of course. But surely you're still going to tell Ragnak, Will had burst out. Holt shook his head doubtfully. The problem is, he's got in first. If we make a counter-accusation now, it will look as if we're simply doing it to save Evanlin. Chances are, Ragnak will ignore it altogether. But you can't let him get away with... Will began, but Holt held up a hand to silence him. I'm not letting him get away with anything, he reassured them. We'll just have to pick the right time to bring the matter up, that's all. Now, Slagor turned back to the woman on the floor. Tell the Orbial, he repeated. The woman said nothing, and Slagor turned to Ragnak in exasperation. My head slave overheard her talking to some of the others, he explained. She's Araluan originally, and she said she recognised this girl here. He jerked a thumb in Evelyn's direction, as the Princess Cassandra, Duncan's daughter. Ragnak's eyes narrowed, and he turned slightly to inspect Evelyn. Her chin went up and she stood a little taller under his gaze. She does have something of the look of Duncan about her, he said suspiciously. No, no, I was mistaken, the slave burst out suddenly. On her knees, she stretched her hands out to Slagor in supplication. Now I see her close too. I realise I was wrong, Lord Slagor. I was mistaken. You called her my lady, Slagor reminded her. It was a mistake, that's all, a mistake. Now I see her properly. I can tell it's not her, the woman insisted. Slagor regarded her with a pained expression on his face. He turned to Ragnak again. She's lying, Obiyal, he said. I'll have my men beat the truth out of her. He made a signal to the two men again, and one of them came forward, uncoiling a short, thick whip as he came. The woman cringed away from him. No, please, my lord, please. Her voice was shrill with fear as she tried to crawl away. Slagor's men grabbed a handful of her hair to stop her, and she cried out again, in pain as well as fear. He raised the vicious-looking whip over his head, ready to bring it down. Leave her alone, Evelyn cried, and her voice froze the sailor where he stood. He looked uncertainly to Slagor for direction, but the wolf ship captain was watching Evelyn, waiting for her to say more. All right, she said quietly. I'm Cassandra. There's no need to torture her further. The silence in the room was almost a physical force. Then an excited buzz broke out among the assembled crowd. Will distinctly heard the words, Phallus Vow, from several different sources. Silence! roared Ragnak, and instantly the noise ceased. He rose and moved forward to confront Evelyn, glaring down at her. You are Duncan's daughter? She hesitated, then replied. I am King Duncan's daughter, she said, with a slight emphasis on his title. Cassandra, Princess of Araluen. Then you are my enemy, he said, spitting the words out, and I've sworn that you should die. Irak stepped forward. 
and I've sworn that she will be safe here, Obeyal, he said. I gave my word when I asked the ranger to help us. Ragnak looked up angrily. Again, there was a buzz of conversation through the room. Iraq was a popular Jarl among the Scandians, and Ragnak hadn't reckoned on having to contend with him over this matter. With an invading army only days away from his stronghold, he knew he couldn't afford a split with his senior war leader. I am Obeyal, he said. My vow is of greater importance. Iraq folded his arms across his chest. Not to me it isn't, he said, and there was a chorus of agreement from the crowd. Iraq cannot defy you like this. You are Obeyal. Slagor suddenly interjected. Have him imprisoned. He is defying your vow to the Vallas. Shut up, Slagor, Irak told him in an ominously calm voice. Then he readdressed himself to Ragnak. I didn't ask you to take your death vow, Ragnak, he said. But if you want to carry it out, I'm afraid you'll have to go through me to do it. Now Ragnak stepped down from his podium and walked closer to where Irak stood. They were of equal height, both massively built. He faced his old companion, the anger burning in his eyes. Irak, did you know? Did you know who she was when you brought her here? Irak shook his head. Slagor snorted in disgust. Of course he knew, he cried then stopped suddenly as the point of Irak's dagger appeared under his nose. I'll allow that once, Irak told him. See it again, and you're a dead man. Wordlessly, Slagor backed away from the bigger man, putting a safe distance between himself and the point of his knife. Irak sheathed the dagger and turned back to Ragnak. I didn't know, he said. Otherwise... I would never have brought her here, knowing your vow. But the fact remains, I vouch for her safety, and my word is all important to me, as is yours to you. Damn it and blast it, Irak, Ragnak shouted. The Temujai are only three or four days' march from here. We can't afford to be fighting amongst ourselves now. It would be a shame if you had to face the Temujai with at least one, and possibly both, of your best leaders dead, Holt put in mildly, and the Obial rounded on him in a fury. Shut up, Ranger! I'm of half a mind to believe that this is all you're doing. No good ever came of dealing with your kind. Holt shrugged, unimpressed by the Scandian's fury. Be that as it may, he said. It occurs to me that there might be a solution to your problem, for the time being at least. The buzz of conversation through the room was cut short as Ragnak swung his gaze around angrily. He watched Holt with narrowed eyes, expecting some trick or some kind of subterfuge. What are you talking about? My vow is binding upon me, he said, and Holt nodded agreement. I understand that, but is there any time factor involved? He asked. Now Ragnak looked puzzled as well as suspicious. Time factor? How do you mean? If we accept that you plan to do your best to kill Evelyn, knowing that Irak will try to stop you when you do, not to mention the fact that if he doesn't, I most certainly will, have you vowed that you'll do it at any particular time? Holt continued. The puzzled expression on Ragnak's face grew more intense. No, I didn't specify any time. I just made the vow, he said finally. And Holt nodded several times. Good, so as far as these Vallas are concerned, they don't care whether you try to fulfill your vow today or if you choose to wait, say, until after we've sent the Temujai packing? Understanding was beginning to dawn on the Obial's face. That's right, he said slowly. As long as the intent is there, the Vallas will be satisfied. No! A shrill voice cut across them. It was Slagor, 
the silky, self-satisfied tones gone from his voice now. Can't you see, Obrial? He's trying to trick you. He has something in mind. The girl must die and she must die now. Otherwise, your sworn word is worthless. Slagor's anger and his long-held desire for revenge on Evelyn for the events that had occurred on Scorgel had caused him to go too far. Ragnac turned on him now, a flame of anger burning in his eyes. Slagor, I advise you to get rid of this reckless habit of telling your peers that they are liars, he said, and instantly the wolf ship captain retracted his accusation. Of course, Obial, I didn't mean... Ragnac cut him off before he could go further. My first concern is for the safety of Scandia. With his Temujai on our doorstep, Irak and I cannot afford to be fighting. If he'll agree to postpone our differences until after we've settled with them, then I will too. Irak nodded agreement instantly. It sounds like a good compromise to me. There was still one thread of suspicion in Ragnac's mind. He turned back to Holt, his heavy brows knitted together in a frown. I can't help wondering what's in it for you, Ranger. All you've done is win a postponement. Holt inclined his head slightly to one side as he considered the matter. True, he replied, but a lot can happen in the next few days. You might be killed in the battle, or Iraq, or me, or all three of us. Beside that, my immediate priority is the same as yours, to see these Temujai driven back. After all, if they win here, it won't be long before they're invading Araluan as well. I have a sworn duty to try to prevent that. He smiled grimly. That's another of those vows that we all seem to rush around taking. Damned nuisances, aren't they? Ragnac turned and stepped back up on the dais to his massive council chair. We're agreed then, he said. We'll settle the Temujai question first. Then we'll come back to this problem. Irak and Holt exchanged glances. Then both men nodded. Only Slagor seemed to be in disagreement with the compromise. He muttered a curse under his breath. Holt took Evelyn's arm and began to guide her from the great hall, followed by the two apprentices and Irak. They hadn't gone half a dozen paces when Holt turned back to Ragnac. Of course, there is one more question that I'd like to hear Slagor answer, he said. As he hoped, at the mention of his name, everyone in the room involuntarily glanced at Slagor. Then, when all eyes were on him, Holt continued, Perhaps he could tell us what his ships are doing at Falkork Island.